Okay, for three. Rebound by Peyton Crispin. He's going to put it back. And oh, he's got it. And the Lakers get a three. Welcome back again. He's a bird. Oh, he was Rock Lakers. He can't get the shot to go. And the Lakers win the ball game. Go! Do you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. I'm Private First Class Taylor Irwin, and I'm with the Maryland Army National Guard. I joined the Army National Guard to begin my career. So I have been awarded tuition assistance, and I picked furthering my education. Right now we're just going through the basics. We're doing the confidence course. It's to get over your fears basically and to see how far your team has come. It takes a strong leader and strong drill sergeants as well. You're gonna meet some really cool people and they're gonna help you get through it either way. So it's gonna be really fun. This is Southwestern's dental assisting program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Congratulations, you just got accepted into college. Now, how do you pay for it? Fortunately, there are several options out there to consider. Follow this simple step-by-step -step guide as you figure out how to pay for college. Step one, fill out your FAFSA. Ah, free application for federal student aid, FAFSA. Your FAFSA will determine if you qualify for financial aid including grants, some scholarships, work study, and federal student loans. The good news is most people qualify for some financial aid, which is why this is the most important step in figuring out how to pay for college. Step two, figure out how much you may need to borrow by weighing your college costs versus your contributions, including any grants or scholarships. Some easy arithmetic will make your math teachers proud. Let's say your college of choice costs $30,000 a year after factoring in tuition, housing, books, lab fees, and a laptop. Now, let's pretend that the money found in your family swear jar, your bowling scholarship, your federal grant, and the money you saved as a scuba instructor contributes $10,000 to your college fund. Voila! This is how much you will need to cover through other means. Many families consider student loans a reliable option. Step 3. There are two categories of student loans you can consider, federal and private. Federal loans are made by the government and private loans are made by private lenders. In some cases, families use both to cover the cost of college. Compare student loan options by looking at their interest rates, repayment options, and fees. Interest rates vary depending on the loan type. Federal loan rates are fixed, while private loan rates can be fixed or variable and are determined by your credit quality. Adding a cosigner, like mom and dad, may help lower your interest rate. Repayment options for federal and private loans are also different. Some providers require in-school payments, some don't. Take a look at these now and choose an option that makes sense for you. Watch out for fees. Fees can be charged upfront or in repayment, and they add to the total cost of the loan so you end up paying more back. Step four, factor in other benefits when researching a loan. Some reduce your interest rate and some give you cash back. For example, Discover student loans have no fees and give you a cash reward for a 3.0 GPA or equivalent. 
Let's go through these steps one more time, just in case you needed a refresher. Step one, fill out your FAFSA. Step two, weigh your school cost versus your contributions. Maximize any free money like personal savings, grants, and scholarships before considering loans. Step three, compare interest rates, repayment options, and fees. Step four, take into account any benefits the loan provider may offer. Don't forget that you can continue to reduce the amount you need to borrow with scholarships. If you are an eligible current or college-bound student, you can enter to win a $2,500 Discover Student Loan Scholarship Award. Head over to collegecovered.com to learn more about paying for college and enter to win. No purchase or loan required. The first week of school can always be a bit overwhelming, but a little bit of good old college ingenuity can go a long way. Here are 10 collegiate quality hacks that will make campus life a little more comfortable. Wow, so with the groundbreaking, no more giant whoever I am that I'm never going to introduce myself again as long as I do this gig. <laughs> and if you're going, huh? So for however many years leading into months, we've been waiting on the groundbreaking for the health science building. Yesterday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that event actually did take place. And if you'd like to see President Patty Scott driving a large uh, piece of equipment, Dallas did post that to the college's Facebook page. So a uh, couple of incidentals. If you didn't sign the sheets, if you wouldn't mind doing that uh, when you come in, because a lot of the groups for instance, uh, this evening's sponsor is the International Ocean Discovery Program, uh, requests that you bring in a certain number of people. So first and foremost, thank you all for making it out on a lovely rainy evening. Uh, but it's one of those things that helps me justify bringing folks in, whether it's through IRIS, whether it's through the International Ocean Discovery Program, different, different groups like that. Uh, also, Take note, if you have some places to throw some posters, the last talk in this academic year is on May 17th, Extreme Life of the Sea, continuing an ocean-related program. Uh, take some posters with you, put them around uh, your neighborhoods and towns. That would be fantastic. So this evening's speaker comes to us from Texas A&M University, one of the country's leading oceanographic institutions. and came originally, her academic background, from the University of Bremen in Germany. She started at Penn State, and instead of continuing to be a Nittany Lion, ended up in Texas at UT Austin. And I was trying to make that connection, and finally it's like, oh, that's right, her advisor bailed on Penn State, 
and move to UT Austin. So when you're a graduate student, usually if your advisor moves, you quit being a Nittany Lion and you go to wherever they are. So she got her PhD at UT Austin, has also done several postdocs, including at Stanford University, and is currently teaching at Texas A&M. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you this evening Dr. Julia Rice, who also gave a talk yesterday afternoon, which we were very appreciative of, because as a leading scientist, as a mom, she took extra time out of her busy schedule dealing with students, work, and family in order to spend some extra time out here on the coast with us. Thank you, Julia. Thank you all very much. I'm very excited to be here. It's been an, a fantastic visit so far, and I really enjoy seeing you all here. Um, thank you very much for the introduction as well. I am going to talk to you today about an ocean-related topic, about mud that you can find in the ocean and bugs or their remains. And so I am also here as an ambassador of the International Ocean Discovery Program. So I will um, familiarize you a little bit more with that program. And to start with, I'm going to take you on a little tour uh, on the timeline that started in Germany, as Ron said. So I was born in Germany. I've been in the States now for 12 and a half years. Um, but I started with my bachelor's in geosciences at the U University of Bremen. And I got to go out on, a, on an icebreaker, the Polarstern, and got to go to Svalbard to take some samples. And that was a fantastic opportunity to take samples and data and write your thesis about it. Um, and then, a year later, I had the opportunity to participate in one of these International Ocean Discovery Program um, research expeditions. My advisor at the time was supposed to go, but he couldn't, and he was like, so, hey, Julia, would you be interested? And I was like, yes, of course. And so that's how it all started, and I have to say that that expedition really changed uh, my whole life and career. That's what made me move to the States. and. Uh, my mom's biggest fear that I would never leave and return to Germany um, became true. <laughs> so you will hear a little bit more about um, that expedition that I participated in. So that was in 2005, towards the end of my master's. And then in 2006, I finished with my master's from the University of Bremen in Germany. Um, also a degree in geosciences, more focused on modeling, numeric modeling. And then I started, as Ron said, uh, at Penn State. And my advisor gave me um, the choice, do you want to move to Texas or do you want to stay here and find a new project and a new advisor? And it was a difficult decision, but I'm glad that I decided to move as well. Um, and so I started then yeah, at Penn State, spent there a year and then moved to Texas and continued at the University of Texas in Austin. But I also had an opportunity to go to MIT for seven months and learn a lot about geotechnical engineering in the civil engineering department there. And all that knowledge that I gained, I then took to UT and helped my advisor in setting up his lab. And who knew that a couple of years later, I would actually need to know that knowledge to build my own lab. So it was a great um, experience. And then I graduated in 2011. Um, and then did two postdocs, the first one in Austin at the Bureau of Economic Geology and another one in the Department of Geophysics at Stanford. Both of those were more related to hard rock and looking at unconventional reservoirs, how um, fluids or gas migrate through those hard rocks that we now um, produce hydrocarbons from in some areas. And then since 2014, I've been an assistant professor, so I returned to Texas after my short time on the West Coast, and um, I have started my research group, Sediment Mechanics, and you can see a picture of my group here. Um, a few of the students, my graduate students are still there, but the undergraduates have uh, graduated and moved on since the picture was taken. And so this is a little bit more about me, um, and now I want to tell you what really my goals are for this lecture tonight. So I really want to um, get, share some of my enthusiasm about the ocean drilling program and hope that you will 
uh, see some fascination, get inspired, and um, hopefully you walk out here, you know, learning something and um, being excited about the oceans as much as I am. And then I also want to instill some understanding of how um, sediments get deposited and buried in the ocean and how microfossils can potentially um, initiate submarine slope failure in the oceans. So those are two examples that I will talk about towards the end, some applications of the research that we are doing. So this is the outline for tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about some marine sediments in general at first, and then I will talk about the ocean drilling program and show you some of the platforms that are being used and the expeditions that are currently taking place. And then uh, my involvement in the program, you saw that I participated in an expedition, but there are more involved or more instances where I have been involved with the program. And then I will talk about um, the two research examples here where we look at some sediment mixtures and their behavior and then a, an application of microfossils and how they relate to submarine landslides. So marine sediments, what, what are those? If I asked you, what do you think, what are they composed of? Can you think of anything? What do you find in the deep ocean? Sand? Seashells or? Uh -huh. <laughs> Tectonic plates. That's on a, on a large scale and they are covered by the sediments, right? So a few things that I have posted here, and this is not inclusive, are um, like sand, for example, is often quartz or feldspar, um, but then we also have clay minerals, and these are terrigenous particles that are coming from land and get dumped into the oceans. We also have organisms, micro, macro organisms that are uh, in these sediments. And then the remains, several organisms, they live in the ocean, in the water column, and when they die, their remains settle down to the ocean floor and form large um, um, portions of our sediments that we find on the ocean floor. And some of these are foraminifera, diatoms, radiolaria, coccolith, and these have different skeletons. Some are made out of calcium carbonate and some are made out of uh, silica. And then we can find some tephra layers if we might be close to um, volcanoes and we had eruptions, ash can travel far and can also be found in the sediments. And then some um, iron manganese nodules, for example, these are um, all precipitates, they form um, on the ocean floor, and some heavy minerals, for example. And so what I'm really focusing on for my research are the clay and quartz, and um, the biogenic remains, and I also have one student who's looking at bacteria, so uh, the organisms uh, category here as well. Now, you might wonder, well, why do we care about these marine sediments? Um, for a long time, people have you know, studied sands because they're really good um, aquifers. We can um, you know, extract water, but they're also really good reservoirs for hydrocarbons and good storage uh, um, reservoirs for waste material. But why do we study marine sediments, and particularly these finer grained um, materials? And there are several reasons. Uh, you may remember that um, several years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, the Macondo um, um, well and the Deepwater Horizon blowout, that was a huge disaster, and um, overpressures were involved in that. So in increasing um, pressures in the subsurface that weren't quite uh, predicted right or dealt with, uh, those were part of the reason here, and so that's why really it is important to understand all the materials that we are drilling through to actually get down to the depth where we produce hydrocarbons from. Also, methane hydrates are often host in these marine sediments, and as um, global warming continues and sea level is rising, these methane hydrates become unstable, and uh, methane can be released to the atmosphere, also, we are looking at these methane hydrates for energy. And um, the life itself, uh, you know, we don't really know what is all down there. How deep does the life exist in the subsurface? And what type of life? So 
um, the sediments are hosting a lot of different types of organisms, and that's another reason why we want to study them. And then submarine landslides. These are landslides that you might um, find here um, out you know, on the, um, on the road, on the road cut, on the cliffs, but these also occur subaqueously, which means underwater, in lakes and in the ocean. They can be caused by earthquakes um, or by other disturbances, and these can be quite devastating. They can destroy infrastructure on the seafloor, um, pipelines, cables, communication, um, different types of things, and also they can potentially cause tsunami. And these were the signs that I saw a lot as I was driving on Thursday from the airport in Eugene out here. Um, so I'm sure that you are all pretty aware um, what tsunamis are and what the hazard here particularly to your coast is. So now I want to talk a little bit about the scientific drilling program. It all started in the 50s as the Project Moho. And then in 1968, the deep sea drilling program was formed. And first it was only really a US funded program, but then other international partners joined. And in 1985, the ocean drilling program started, abbreviated as ODP. And then it was followed by the integrated ocean drilling and since 2013, the International Ocean Discovery Program. And so these are all um, programs that are funded by the, Fed, uh, by, the, by the government. Uh, the National Science Foundation is funding this program. And these are 10-year phases where the community decides on what we want to study, what is important, um, what has value to us, and then we follow this plan. So here you can see the, the plan for this current phase, and we are more than halfway through, so we are trying to assess now, have we really accomplished what we wanted to do? And then also we are thinking about the next phase, what as a community do we want to do? And um, we have to sell it well so that the National Science Foundation is continuing and renewing the program. And so in the current science plan, we have several themes, which is climate, deep life, the um, deeper crustal, the deep interior of the Earth, and geohazards. And so those were the themes that um, we all considered as important that we need to learn more about. And one more um, comment here, anecdote. The, you can see that from the last phase to the current phase, the uh, abbreviation did not really change, but the name changed. And because of that Macondo um, accident in the Gulf of Mexico, the word drilling really got a very negative connotation to it. And so that's why we moved from drilling to discovery, because it is really more about just drilling, right? It's not that we are drilling for hydrocarbons. This is a scientific program, an academic program, where we try to do fundamental um, science. And so it's more about uh, you know, discovering different things. And, um, using international emphasizes that international relationship, many different countries contribute to this program. So these are the platforms that are used in the program. Um, up top we have the Joyless Resolution, which is the ship that is operated by the US, and it is actually operated by our um, people at Texas A&M, so we have a large um, building there with staff that includes the technicians, the expedition managers, um, and yeah, everybody who might be involved in an expedition. So Texas A&M has a very unique position in that it's hosting the program um, for our country here. And then we have the Chikyu in the middle here. This is a vessel that's operated by Japan and also mostly works in the Japan waters. And this is a riser platform, which means that it operates more like an offshore oil rig platform um, where you can circulate your drilling fluid back to the ship, whereas for the joyless resolution, it is a simpler setup, which also means that you cannot control the pressure of your fluid as well, and therefore you are more limited in where you go and how deep you drill. And then we have mission-specific platforms. These are really very... Um, and chosen for specific scientific objectives. So there was one expedition a few years ago 
that drilled into the Chicxulub meteor crater in Mexico, and that was in very shallow waters where the Jordan's resolution cannot go to, so they had a specific platform. If you're going to the Arctic or Antarctic Ocean, you would want to have an icebreaker, and so for those situations, you have a different platform, and all of those are managed by the uh, European countries, a consortium of European countries. And you might wonder how the drilling um, works. So here's a cartoon that shows you the joyous resolution up top on the surface. We have the large derrick that allows you to attach several drill pipes and then lift them up, and then you lower it down through the moon pool, which is literally a, a hole in the ship at the bottom, and that allows you to uh, release all the drill pipes, and you lower them down to the seafloor, and then you start drilling into the sediments and potentially the hard rock beneath. And sometimes we use a re-entry cone, which can help when you need to re-enter the hole, when you take out all your drill string and you might want to come back with um, a sensor um, string or some other logging tools, then it is a little bit easier to find that hole. If you imagine you have kilometers of drill pipes or sensors you know, hanging below you, and you try to find this small hole, um, it, it can actually take, take quite some time, and the thrusters here are quite important to stabilize the ship and keep it in just one spot. So over the, the last decades of all these programs, um, we, have, we have drilled in many places of the planet, but they are still lots of opportunities, lots of places where we haven't been to and where we still want to go and explore. Here you only see the expeditions from this current phase. In red are all the expeditions or the sites that were drilled from 2014 through 18. So you see we started, we started here and we tried to do a um, circumnavigation. And so the ship track went from Southern Africa into the Indian Ocean and Pacific and right now, the ship, the Joyless Resolution, is right here, um, doing an, um, an expedition in the Antarctic Ocean. Uh, it will end in May. And then the next uh, expeditions in yellow here till 2021 are highlighted. And the ship is going to go up in the southern um, Pacific, go through the Panama Canal, and then into the Atlantic. And so we actually moved away from a ship track that was proposal driven to where we decided where the ship wanted to go and then we attract the proposals along the way um, because it is way more efficient and fuel is very expensive, the ship is very expensive and so it makes a lot more sense and it takes a long time from writing and submitting a proposal to actually going out and drilling an expedition that is often three, four, five years sometimes. So this is a, a little fun fact. Um, on the left, you see a photo of the storage, the, where all the cores are stored in College Station, so right here in Texas at the university that I am at. And then on the right, you see a picture of the, the other, the second core repository in Germany at the University of Bremen. So if you paid attention, those are places that I lived um, in, and there's a third core repository in Japan, and so I, I keep joking that if I do a career change or if I need another move, then it looks like I have to move to Japan so I can live where the third and last uh, IUDP core repository is. But it is um, a great, great facility, and I really take advantage of the facility being in town. I take my students there um, during classes for a tour, and I take my graduate students there, and we take samples, and um, so it's, it's very unique, and students should see it if they uh, study at Texas A&M. So now, um, one slide on my involvement with the program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in 2005, I got to sail on one of these expeditions that was in the Gulf of Mexico. We left Mobile, Alabama, and then went west toward, towards the Louisiana and Texas coast. There were two regions that we um, drilled with a joyous resolution, and I sailed as a sedimentologist, which means that when you collect all these sediment cores, somebody has to look at them and describe them. Um, 
what color, what grain size, which means what, you know, how large and what shape do the grains have, um, what are the components, are there any faults, folds, any structures that we can see. So that's what I did for two months straight, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So it's, uh, it's fun, but it's also exhausting. And after five, six weeks, people start to be like, ah, okay, I want to go home. <laughs> but it is definitely a great experience. And then um, I was a shore-based scientist for another expedition, which was off of um, Japan. And what shore-based means is that I did not sail, but I was still a member of the science party, um, involved in a lot of the planning and the meetings afterwards. And I um, got the right to publish uh, within a moratorium, after which everything gets publicly available. Um, and so here we see Japan, the Philippine sea plate that's subducting beneath um, Japan. And so here's the trench, the subduction zone, and I used some samples from um, out here that was um, not really wedged in or deformed at all in the subduction zone. And then I was a Schlanger Fellow, which means that for one year as a, as a, as a PhD student, I got funding from the um, program to work on my research. And then I was a member of the science evaluation panel for three years. This is a voluntary um, position where uh, all these drilling proposals get reviewed. So if scientists have ideas and they write a proposal that gets submitted to the panel, the panel looks at it and evaluates it and gives feedback, whether it's good or what should be improved or what's not feasible. And so the panel really sees these proposals several times and eventually it might move on to the next board and get scheduled as an expedition. And then, last but not least, I am now here as one of several um, distinguished lecturers for the 2018 and um, 19 academic year. And so again, at this point, I would like to thank you all again for this opportunity to invite me and host me um, here. So now what I want to do is show you yeah, a few more impressions from when I was uh, on the ship. You see um, Casey Moore here from Santa Cruz. He's retired now, but we were looking at the sediment cores and trying to figure out structural features um, down here, I'm with Derek Sawyer, who's at Ohio State University, and we were sampling these sediment cores. This is Bill Goholi doing some um, geochemistry, extracting pore fluids from these sediment, floor, uh, sediment cores. Um, and here, I'm with my colleagues um, describing the sediment cores again. These are the drillers, and you can actually see the drill bit right here at the bottom of all the drill pipes, so that's what we um, you know, lower through the moon pool, and then what we use to actually drill into the seafloor, into the sediments. And then we had the opportunity to go out on the Zodiac and kind of drive around the ship and see the ship from all perspectives, and that was a neat um, experience. And then you might wonder, well, what do you do during your 12 hours off? And often you work on still some research, but you also need to have a good balance, and there's a gym, there's a movie room, but often you would just see people running on the helicopter deck because um, you might get you know, bored of just being contained in the, in the inside. But if you are there for two months with the same people, uh, you can't get away. You get to know each other very well, and that's how I actually ended up in the States. Uh, one of the two coaches from this expedition recruited me, and that's how I ended up starting my PhD at Penn State. So now I want to uh, kind of step back and think, like, what are the properties of these sediments on the seafloor? And here what we're looking at is just a sketch of porosity, which means the volume of the space that is in between the grains and um, depth, and there are two curves, and this is often what I show my students in class, and I ask them, okay, which of these curves would you think is a sand, and which one might be a clay, an ocean mud? And it is actually quite difficult. You would think, oh, the highest porosity is in the sand, but that is not correct. If we think of a sand, in an idealized case, we can think of them as spheres. And you can see here that 
given the packing, whether they are extremely tightly packed or um, looser packed, you get different porosities. And so there are theoretical thresholds that are between 48 and 26 percent, given that these are idealized spheres. Of course, in reality, it's more complicated. You have different sizes, different shapes. So these are actually high estimates. estimates. So the reduction in porosity for sands is really happening mostly later during other processes, chemical processes, and diagenesis. But a clay, if you look at what a clay mineral, a clay particle looks like compared to a sand grain, so down here we have a cluster of clay minerals they all have extremely platy shapes, so a very different aspect ratio, and they also have forces that make them to attract to each other, and so they form these cardhouse structures that have a very high specific surface area and therefore a very high porosity. So these clays can hold a lot of water, and we're talking about um, 70, 80 percent of porosity on the seafloor. So that means we have out of a volume of sediment, 70 percent or 80 percent is water um, out of the whole um, volume. And so that then decreases pretty significantly with depth as you bury it and all these particles start to rearrange and move past each other and um, align perpendicular to the applied stress, which is mostly the vertical stress. And so that's why we really um, get a very different behavior for a clay um, compared to a sand. And this is important for what I'm studying. And so we try to figure out, well, what, what is it really that controls these, what we call compression trends? And so there are some groups that have tried to study it in a very systematic way. They have taken a min clay mineral that is a kaolinite and then mixed that with some silt, which is quartz, just a little bit um, in a finer size. And you can see that there are some systematic trends here. But is it really so representative if you just take two minerals and mix them together? I thought, well, wouldn't it be better if you could use some natural materials and test the compression behavior of those? And so um, instead of using just two components here and be limited by the grain size um, and using less realistic grain shapes, I started using a technique called resedimentation, which is a, a way to simulate the sedimentation and the burial that's happening in the nature but you do it in the lab under controlled conditions. You can really decide what you want to put in there and make your own sediments, make your own muds in the lab. So you see an intact sample that was cored and then its resedimented version down below. And the advantages here of um, this technique is that we end up with very little disturbance. The coring process itself causes a lot of disturbance in the sediment cores, but doing it in your lab, you can reduce these um, disturbances. And also, um, we can really control what we are putting in there. I often refer to this as baking. It's like making brownies. You, you, know, you use this much of flour, this much of water and sugar, you mix it together. And um, if you're happy, you're happy with the result, but if not, you might change a little bit. And if you only change one thing at a time, then you'll actually know what really you know, causes the, the improvement in your cake at the end. So that's really how we are doing it in the lab. And so it is also very repeatable because we end up with a homogeneous sample. So this allows us to do very systematic um, studies in understanding fundamental behavior. And I'm going to um, walk you through this process now. So we will start with a dry powder. So this is disaggregated sediment uh, powder that we mix with water. We stir it together and form it into a very smooth slurry. Um, and then we de-air the slurry. So that means we are pulling out air bubbles that might have been incorporated by the mixing process. And then we pour the slurry into this consolidometer. And over time, we slowly add weights on top of the slurry so that we can comp um, press out the fluids and 
You see different stages here. We are adding a transducer, so we actually can collect digital data of how tall the sample is and how much it shrinks with time. And then this is at the maximum stress, which is a 20, 10, and 2 kilogram weight on each side. And so that will take you to 100 kilopascal, which might not tell you much, but it would be the equivalent of 10 meters of burial. So not much at all, but we went from something very soupy to something that you can actually touch and squish, and you can then um, do further experiments with these and you know, see how the porosity has really changed as we added more stress onto these samples. And so the sediment itself, you can think of it as um, the grains as these yellow little balls, and the grains then can be represented by a spring, like you see here. And the pore fluid in between the grains is the blue fluid right here. Now, if you start pushing on the fluid, like in um, image two, then this little tube here indicates the pressure in the fluid. So if you press on it, then the pressure in the fluid goes up only when you open this valve in step three and you actually allow the pore fluid that is in between the grains to escape, to go away, that's when the pressure goes down in the fluid and the spring can shorten, which means that your porosity goes down and you can actually compress your sediment. And so this is all um, called consolidation. It is following Tazagi's theory from 1923. And what we are interested in are the parameters stiffness and permeability. And so the stiffness is how strong the spring is, how strong can it you know, hold against the pressure that you are applying. And then the permeability is how easy it is for the fluid to get squeezed out. And those are things that we are trying to understand in these marine sediments. So now I'm going to um, show you these two examples briefly. With the first one, I'm going to show you how the addition of some silt to clay can change these properties that I just introduced, stiffness and permeability. And so for this project, I used the material from the expedition that was offshore of Japan. So again, from this side. And what we did is we collected just a bunch of chunks that were left over from um, other projects. And then I used this ball grinder to get it all down to a small fine powder we sifted and we mixed it and then we ended up with this Home Depot bucket full of powder that is all one batch, homogeneous, and so really good for repeatability. And then I, um, so this is now this mudstone from offshore Japan that is represented by some silt grains and some clay particles. So we are located right here. And then what I did is I bought some silt off of the shelf and I mixed it in with this mud from Japan. And so this is the silt, which lies right here. And so I mixed these two in five, or now I think six different um, fractions. And so I controlled, or I kept constant my two components. I just changed how much of each I had. And so then um, the result of these resedimentation tests is what you see on this graph. So we have six lines here. The black line is the one for the pure mud that came from the um, Japan continental shelf. The one down here in um, maroon for Texas A&M um, is the, the silt that I bought off of the shelf. And then in between are the intermediate mixtures. And so what you're looking at here on the left is something called void ratio, which you may not have heard of at all. That's what the engineers, civil engineers or geotechnical engineers use. But this is a term that is related to porosity, so to the volume of the pores in between the grains. And on the horizontal is the stress. So the stress that we applied onto these sediment samples. And so what you see is that all of these curves show a linear behavior um, on this semi-logarithmic plot and all start out with very high porosities and then go down to low porosities. And the slope of this line is this parameter stiffness, like how strong the spring is, how, 
strong the sediment is. And um, you can also see that the slope is changing slightly, but more significantly, the initial porosity is really changing here. And now, um, we can take this to another level. We have this little resedimented sample, which was only stressed to very small stresses, but if we are interested at high stresses, then we can take the sample and put it in this load frame, which can then take it to stresses that go um, to 20, 30 megapascal, which is about two kilometers, three kilometers of burial. And so here, we see the same parameters on these graphs, but now you see that the shape is a little bit different. And so this first part here of the curve, again, and I'm pointing just out the pure mud from Japan, this first part here behaves like a sponge. So when you squish on it and you let go, it bounces back. This is an elastic behavior. And at this point here, this inflection point where the behavior changes, this is exactly at 100 kilopascal, which, if you paid attention, was the stress that we resedimented the samples to. So these fine-grained materials, these clays, have actually a memory. They remember the stress that they have been buried to in the past. And once they go past this stress, then they not behave elastically anymore, but elastoplastically. And the best example would be Play-Doh. So if you push on some Play-Doh and you let go, it's not going to go back to its um, original shape. And so that's what happening, what's happening to these sediments. And in black, um, the pure Nankai clay has a much um, steeper slope, which means it is a lot more compressible or less stiff than the silt that is shown here now in red and not maroon anymore. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, and then you see in the middle, you know, the slope, the angle of this line is um, changing, and also the porosity here is systematically dropping as we adding more and more silt to the mixture. And so we compress this all to 21 megapascal, which is about two kilometers below the seafloor. And then we can also infer permeabilities from these tests, and this is again the ability for fluids to move through the sediment, and so here we are now looking at this parameter, the permeability versus the porosity. And so the way we, that we read this is we are starting here at high porosities. And then as we start to compress the sediment more and more, the permeability is being reduced along with the porosity. And so in black, again, we have the, uh, the clay, the finest grained mixture. And in red here, the coarsest sample. And so if you look at just one particular porosity, let's pick 40%, or well, 0.4 here, and we go up, we see that since this is on a logarithmic scale, there's actually two orders of magnitude difference in the permeability at one given porosity for a change in the grain size that is um, about 24%. And you might be like, oh, yeah, what, what does this mean? But these are parameters that people often use in large-scale models and basin models to understand how the basin evolved as time, pressure, temperature went on. And so being able to understanding these parameters and predicting these parameters better, finding relationships that go into these models is an extremely important. And two orders of magnitude is huge. Um, maybe you can just take my word for that. Um, but you might wonder then, you know, what, what controls this behavior? And so then we, we can take some images at the very fine scale. What you see on the left here is a scanning electron microscope image. And um, what you use these microscopes for is indicated by the red arrow, which goes from one nanometer to 100 micrometer. So it's like... Um, 10 to the negative 9 meters and um, 100 micrometer, here's 1 millimeter, which is um, 10 to the 3 meters. So these are extremely tiny features like bacteria, um, things that you, know, you can't see by eye, you can't see with a hand lens, you can't see with a normal microscope, so you really need to have this extreme magnification. And we have a scale here of 5 micrometers, so this is a 
five millions of a meter. And these are the silt grains, and these are the clay particles that are extremely small. But what we take away from this image is that if you have a significant concentration of these silt grains, these larger grains here, then you start to preserve a lot of pore space. And that's what you see here, what is a little bit darker outlined here. This is large pore space that is preserved in between these silt grains. So these silt grains act like a shadow pretty much. They take a lot of the stress and then behind them they preserve pore spaces. And through these pores we can transport fluids um, significantly. And so this is really controlling the, the general, the overall behavior. Okay, now um, let's kind of switch gears a little bit and look at an application in submarine landslides. This is a map that shows some mass transport deposits or the deposits that resulted from submarine landslides. Well, not only submarine, but also subaerial. So in white, the white triangles are subaerial and the black um, triangles are submarine. And what I want to focus on um, tonight is the western coast of Africa. And there are several slides um, the Mauritania, Senegal slide, but I will show you a few more. So if we zoom into this location, you can see here Morocco, Western Sahara, Mauritania, um, Senegal. So this is the northwestern uh, margin of Africa. And what is outlined in these brown um, shades, these are all submarine landslides. So all slides that occurred underwater on the continental slope. And we went to this margin already a long time ago, one of the older ODP legs, 108, uh, yeah, 108, went out there. And now a group of us is working on going back there and drilling um, potentially some more sites and collecting more data. So this is actually some work that is in progress right now, and we hope to go back there and drill. But what really the key question is, this slope particular is a passive continental margin, so that means there is no active volcanism, no um, subduction where one plate goes beneath the other, and this is extremely flat. It's a, at maximum, three degree angle, um, so how do we get these slopes on such shallow um, gradients? And one of the ideas is that just the presence of microfossils could precondition the sediments in the continental slope for failure. So here is a study that was published in um, geology last year by some German scientists, and this is a cross-section of the Earth. So you're looking at the water column right here in white, and then this is the seafloor, and we use some acoustic uh, signal to um, send a signal down and it reflects off of the seafloor and straighter beneath and so we can use this acoustic um, system to take a picture of the earth underneath the seafloor. So we can see lots of um, parallel reflectors but what we also see are these step functions right here on the seafloor and some further down that were buried at a later time. So these are indications for submarine landslides. And now what these scientists pointed out are these layers that are labeled H1 through H6. And these are layers that are extremely rich in diatoms. And diatoms are microfossils, so the remains of um, organisms that were very tiny single-celled organisms, phytoplankton, and it's made out of silica. So we have a few of these layers, I show a zoom in, from a few of these layers indicated in the turquoise color. And if we look at their properties, these layers that are so rich in these microfossils have extremely high porosities, um, low densities, and therefore they there's a significant change in the properties to the overlying and the underlying material. And especially if you cap these layers that are extremely rich in microfossils and water, if you cap those with a material that's clay, for example, that has almost no ability to drain this water that's in the microfossil, then you can build up in pore pressure, a high pressure in these sediments, and that could then potentially destabilize the sediments in, on the continental slope. 
And so we want to understand um, what the role is really of these microfossils. And um, this might be hard to see from the back of the room, and I'm not going to go into detail, but you might see these wiggly lines, and each spike is um, representing a spike in opal or a spike in silica. So this is indicating where we have on this time scale that goes from zero to 600,000 years back. It's indicating where we had a significant abundance of these diatoms. And so then we have to go back and ask what controls the abundance of diatoms. And that goes back to climate and bioproductivity these organisms need enough light, they need enough nutrients, and this is only available under certain conditions. And so if we allow the nutrients to actually diffuse up so that the diatoms can use it in the water column, then they will all die eventually, and their remains will settle to the seafloor and form these very microfossil-rich layers. And so it is really now going to a state where we actually need to study the biology and the climate and the ocean currents to understand the role and the occurrence and recurrence of these diatoms. And so this is a project that I mentioned where several of us came together and wrote one of these drilling proposals. Currently we are at the stage that is called full two proposal, which means we have gone through a pre-proposal through a full one proposal, and now just this, this month, we resubmitted it um, after doing some revisions. And so we hope that this will eventually get scheduled and we can go there and drill and test our hypotheses. And so one of the key questions that I'm mostly interested in is how does ocean productivity and sediment deposition affect the timing and occurrence of these giant submarine landslides? And so, um, this really addresses several themes of the science plan. We cover what climate does, we cover what's happening in the ocean and the earth, and how um, we are studying geohazards. So this is really addressing several themes at, at one time. And so what I think would be great to do is use this resedimentation technique to mix in microfossils with mud in different fractions and then compress it and see at what stress they start to break, which might release a lot of fluid and um, can then cause the sediments to fail, but also to understand what concentration of um, microfossils is important to actually change the behavior. And so and that's what I plan to do, mixing um, the mud with different microfossils, not only diatoms, but we can also use my, um, foraminifera or coccolith or radiolaria, and then um, test the behavior in the laboratory under controlled conditions. So with that, I hope that I have given you some um, inspiration and I have um, taught you something about resedimentation, which is really a technique that was developed in civil engineering, but then in our field in geology, we took it and now apply it to geologic problems and geologic depth or stresses. Um, and I uh, hope that I have shown you that the composition of the sediments significantly matters in how they behave, and um, that microfossils can be very important in potentially forming weak layers and destabilizing um, continental slopes that might result in submarine landslides. So um, with that, I would like to thank a few students here that helped with the projects and the scientists and crews from the expeditions and the program um, for funding me here and supporting me on this lectureship. And thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. Any Anybody have any questions? Went to the wrong side. Ha ha, trick joke. The resedimentation procedure, can you give us some idea of how long that process would the, take, an average? Yeah, any guess? <laughs> no, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Um, it, it of, of course, it depends on the properties. So if you have a material that can drain the fluids very quickly, it doesn't take as long. 
but we are mostly talking about two to four weeks for one sample. So if you have sediments that um, are not so easily diffusing the fluid, then we're talking about one month of a student's life for one sample. <laughs> and, you can, and you can only hope that everything goes well and you don't have to redo it. Plus then some more time in this other load frame, the yellow one that takes it to higher stresses. So it is definitely time consuming, um, but it is also rewarding. And I have four of those resedimentation set up so we can at least run four at the same time. <laughs> So my question is that um, you did some studies in the Gulf of Mexico. Was your drilling deep enough to actually look at some influence of the asteroid impact in that area? Um, or or you're just drilling at a certain depth? Um, we were not quite in the right location to investigate the meteor impact crater. So that is farther um, south, and we were drilling off of the coast of Texas and um, Louisiana. But we were also drilling to yeah, different depths, and so it's a very different depositional environment there, um, different sediments, different research goals. So we wouldn't really be able to address questions from the science expedition that addressed the Chicxulub crater impact um, crater. But they were able to you know, get fantastic results um, from their expedition and publish those in high-end journals uh, soon after the expedition. But it's very different types of rock that, that are um, in those two areas. Got you. An amazing amount of new material for me. Very interesting, thank you. And um, I wonder about the frequency of these um, slides in the, and whether it has anything to do with depth. Uh, yeah, very, very good question. And, um, you know, it is, it is hard to really know about all of these landslides. There are probably several that are occurring that we never know of, but we do have a lot of equipment out in the oceans uh, so that we can actually detect it. Um, on land the same, and especially the USGS, the US Geological Survey, they're doing a lot of research on these landslides, whether subaerial or um, subaqueous, and they are even asking for um, contribution from people, anybody like you. If something happens, if you see a landslide, you could go online and give your feedback, what you saw, what you felt, um, the same for earthquakes. So they're trying to build a large database that can help us in you know, predicting events potentially in the future. But um, they are quite frequent. Um, I can't give you a, a number how many per year. They vary in sizes. But they all originate, I would say, within the first 100 meters of the seafloor. So that's where you are loose and um, um, weak and where you can um, destabilize. So if fluids are migrating through these sediments and they want to come out somewhere, move up to the seafloor, then that's a spot of weakness where material could, get, could fail and then it is just driven by gravity and it goes downslope into the deep ocean and they can turn into um, something called turbidity currents, which can really travel far distances. And so then you might find the deposit far away from the actual um, scar where it failed and it gets transported deep into the um, ocean basin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my question relates to that. It's just the, not just the frequency of how they occur in different places, but in the same place, do you, are there places where these landslides occur over and over again in the same location so that if your hypothesis is correct, you would be able to predict that these are unstable areas. Yes. Uh, so once the material fails, I would say it is probably good for a little bit, um, but there's also different types of failures. So there's a failure called retrogressive failure, which means once, so if we have the slope, once you start failing here, it is actually unloading this portion here, and it makes you know the sediment that we were that used to be next to it. It now there's no stopper anymore, and so it can actually move laterally. So you can see this upward step function. So you have you start with a failure here, but then the failure itself is actually migrating upward to shallower depths. 
And so that can happen where you end up with several head scars that you see in data, in bathymetry data. So that can happen, but um, if you move a large amount of material, then it might take a little bit for the system to um, stabilize and to eventually build up pore pressure again. And then if you have an external trigger, like an earthquake, you can never say when an earthquake is going to happen, but that could then potentially destabilize the same uh, location again. It seems to me that um, you start with something that's stable. You know, it's, it's not moving, and then it moves. So there's a change in fluidity there. And so you should be measuring fluidity of materials or, you know, how it changes uh, with uh, disturbances. You know, we have these situations where people build on sand and then there's an earthquake and the sand shifts and everything becomes fluid. So this is what's happening there too. Right, yes. And there are different mechanisms behind it that uh, causes the failure in the first place, but it is often fluid driven and pressure driven. And what is uh, a very common process is that on these continental slopes, you have maybe a sediment um, a unit that is deposited down here, but the seafloor is at an angle. You know, here is land, here is the deep ocean, so you have more rock over that unit here than you do further out there, and that increased pressure here drives fluids in the subsurface laterally to the location of lower overburden or lower material above and so that lateral movement then transfers fluid, it transfers pressure, and when that reaches a shallow depth, then that's where you can initiate failure. And that happened in the Gulf of Mexico, that happened offshore New Jersey. There are different signs um, uh, or articles out there, research projects out there that, that show this fluid flow um, focusing um, destabilization. So I was actually wondering, um, the landslides themselves, um, are some of them big enough to cause uh, large-scale disasters? Yes, yes, for sure. There's one uh, very famous example, that is the Storiger slide off of Norway, and that uh, resulted in a tsunami that was about 10 to 12 meters high and certainly impacted uh, the UK. So it's, if it's a large volume of material that gets displaced in a very short amount of time, you can only imagine that that material has to displace the water and the water has to go somewhere. And so it's just going to you know, rise and um, end up in, uh, in a tsunami. At the same time, you can also um, yeah, have large flooding um, storm surges that result or, or make it just worse. Uh, um, damage to infrastructure on the seafloor, but I would say the tsunami is really the, the, the most devastating because it has such a large you know, socioeconomic impact on the coastal regions. So I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Thanks, Dallas, for your work this evening. Some of you may have noticed a nice basket with some almonds out in the lobby when you signed in. If you didn't sign in, go ahead and do that on your way out. Also, be sure to grab some posters for the May 17th talk. And those uh, almonds were a gift at the groundbreaking and basically an indicator that we're still raising funds, even though uh, we've raised over $21.8 million, which is astounding for this community. Thank you, someone, uh, for all the work that you put into that. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the things is that that's towards uh, nursing equipment, but all kinds of departments need equipment in that new building when it comes around. So Circle October 2020, I'll tell you the specific date when it gets a little bit closer, maybe even May. October, yeah, I couldn't remember. I heard it Friday, but I've been running around a little bit. Thank you all for coming out today. Thank you to Julia. Thank you all very much. And the International Ocean Discovery Program for funding her travel out here. And thank you again, all of you, for taking time in 
your schedule as well as on this beautiful sunny day to come over to SWAC. Uh, I'm sure Julie would be pleased to answer a couple more questions. I'm going to ask you to hold off until she gets her computer unplugged so we can get her into the lobby so that we can free up Dallas for the rest of his evening as well. Thank you all.